So I uh, recall that I wanted we were, we wanted to study this uh, the a, a, a construction or a, an, an, exi an existence proof of a of a of a uh, epsilon randomizing map that goes to some rho a tilde tensor rho b tensor n. <coughs> So the, to to apply the the sampling bound, which I will not uh, write down again. What we will first of all, we, we need to massage the state a little bit. So that's a very standard information theoretical procedure. Whenever you deal with with this kind of thermodynamical limit of something, so the simplest case being n copies of a state, <coughs> you first truncate the state or you modify the state such that in a suitable norm it's close to the original. Uh, tensor copy and tensor copies, and then you have uh, you have a number of properties that you get essentially for free by by this typicality principle. Uh, so the 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 most important part here is that we can restrict the support the the range of this of the state, which originally is just a to a to the n tensor b to the n, to some smaller subspaces whose growth is dominated by entropies. And such that restricted to those subspace to the subspace to those subspaces, the reduced states have almost flat spectrum. So the eigenvalues are of the order one over this magical dimension, and for rho b the same one over this dimension. In addition, even the joint state, uh, we also restrict that globally to a, to a subspace, which I don't need to mention here. Such that, all, uh, so this is only on the on the on the range of this of of this operator. Uh, so there are other zero eigenvalues, uh, such that all the eigenvalues are two to the minus n, the entropy of rho plus minus epsilon. Here. And this epsilon is is a is a <coughs> is a given is a given parameter, which which essentially is this epsilon from the epsilon randomizing. We let it go to zero later. So and then uh, it's clear that it's enough to decorrelate this state rho n a hat b hat why is that because this uh, the 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 map that we write down here is cptp so it's contractive in the trace norm so if we apply it to this or to that, it will, it will, uh, the, the distance will be less than epsilon. So then we can use triangle inequality. So now I want to show you how, how we got the, the direct part, the, the, the other direction for of the lower bound that I showed yesterday. So what I want to show is that, that uh, lim sub n going to infinity and epsilon suitably going to zero, of course. I mean, this, this has to be now very gently uh, go to zero of 1 over n of this log capital N and epsilon less than or equal to the mutual information of the state rho. So that I remind you what S of rho A as S of rho B minus the joint entropy S of rho B. Okay, so I already take up all the blackboards just writing down the what I want to prove. So that, uh, well, it's, it's <laughs> maybe it's not so bad I, I wrote it. This requires that we come up with a particular uh, bunch of this number of unitaries. And so how do we do this? So the first step is uh, well, okay, the proof will be uh, by probabilistic method. So I will just show you how to pick, I will just uh, define an ensemble from which we will pick these unitaries. So it will define a random channel. And then I want to prove that with high probability it does exactly what we, what we need. So you, first of all, you choose <coughs> a probability measure, a probability distribution mu on the unitary group of A hat. So 
So recall that this is, I simply, I simply forget that there is this a to the n. And my unitaries will, first of all, just act on a hat, and I will extend them by identity to, to the surrounding space. <coughs> With the with the property with the with the property that it uh, that the the following map so uh, let's say sigma going to the integral d mu of of unitary u sigma u dagger <coughs> that this is the uh, this is the maximally mixed state for all sigma. Yeah, so this is a this is a state. Well more generally I have to put the trace of sigma here. Yeah, so the uh, there are many such measures. I mean maybe maybe you ask yourself first of all, can I even choose one? There are many. One of them, I mean maybe the mathematically most useful one is Haar measure, the unique unitary invariant probability measure. That is why that works. I mean, it's the easiest one to see because this average here then is manifestly unitary invariant, and the only operators invariant under conjugation by unitary are the multiples of the identity. But there are plenty of others. So the smallest one, for example, the smallest uh, uh, support of such a measure is actually dimension of a hat squared. <coughs> so it's quite easy to see why it cannot be any smaller. It's a, it's a simple algebraic argument. Um, and for example, you can attain this by choosing the, the discrete Weil-Heisenberg group. So this is the, the, the group of unitaries generated by the cyclic shift and by the diagonal matrix with the with uh, powers of nth root of unity on the, along, the, along the diagonal. So both these measures do it, but I will just I just want you to pick one of them. I mean anyone will do. <coughs> so and then <coughs> and then we just draw these unitaries independently at random from this measure. So so draw iid u1 all the way to u capital N. And uh, we find out later what what n we need for 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 our purposes from this measure mu and that means well okay so i want to i want to arrive at operators so where are this where are the sums of independent operators well i just define xi now to be ui tensored with the identity acting on this row superscript n Yeah, because what do we, we know, thanks to uh, let me call them Y, yeah? So this kind of, let's just continue here. So note the expectation of this YI. So that's the same for all of them. This is simply the, the integral over these unitaries, and then we use this relation here, so we get 1 over, and we get this maximally mixed state tensor, whatever is on the other side. So that is uh, rho n b. Yeah, so it, I hope, I hope uh, that makes sense. <coughs> Yeah, so it's just a linear extension of this map tensoring with the identity. So that means you must get here a partial trace. So and yeah, so this is now the setting we want to apply this. Well, clearly these y's are, are bounded. In fact, they are, they are extremely tightly bounded. They are positive semi-different operators. And unlike my abstract theorem, they are not upper bounded by one, but they are upper bounded by uh, this one some exponentially small number. So, so for, for ease of, uh, of application, let's just rescale these guys. 
So we put 2 to the n times s of a b minus epsilon y i. And this is now in the unit interval. So I'm just being pedantic here. And then the expectation of these guys is just the, the corresponding uh, 2 to the n s of a b minus epsilon. And we have similar bounds for these. We know what is the dimension here. Or we have an upper bound. And we have a lower bound on the eigenvalues of the, this thing here. So in the end, we actually get, here we get a 1 over a 2 to the minus 2 to the minus n times s of a. Here we get a 2 to the minus n times s of b. Here we have a plus s of a b. So all, it, all together, I get a 2 to the minus n neutral information between A and B. Minus something like 3 epsilon, right? Maybe plus, plus. Yeah, something, something like this, huh? Uh, identity here. So this is my mu. This is this mu that I this uh, that I had in the in the theorem of uh, before. So I have a lower bound on this expectation value, and that means I have a probability that that uh, the the sum of y i's sorry not n capital n is, for example, not low upper bound by 1 plus epsilon times the expectation. So yeah, let's, let's call this just m. <coughs> so this or, or not lower bounded by 1 minus epsilon times m. So this clearly, by just changing the, the sign, you can, get, you can get bounds in the opposite direction. This is upper bounded by, well, first of all, two times the dimension. So the dimension of this stuff is this here. So that's already, that looks fairly big because it, it goes exponential with small n. But our, our sampling bound is even stronger. So there's this e to the minus uh, relative entropy between 1 plus minus epsilon mu relative to mu. Um, times n. Yeah. Yeah, so this is just report, I mean, this is just a special case of the, of the sampling bound after I did the massaging to make, to make the uh, to make the expectation value actually equal to this one, to kind of twist the operator a little bit, and I can do this. And then recall, I, I, I claimed a certain thing that, that this one here, this relative error version, the, the relative entropy is linear, in, is, I mean, the, can be bounded by something linear in mu and quadratic in epsilon. So this is something like this then. So actually, let's be, let's be generous, a to the n, b to the n, e to the minus n. And then we had epsilon, so some, sorry, constant epsilon square n times mu. And for mu, I just, we just recall what this here was. No, it's not n, it's, it's always capital N. Huh? Yeah, so recall, I want, to I want to prove, ultimately, I want to prove the existence of a relatively small set uh, such that 
this average here is close to the expectation. So it's a much stronger requirement, which is exactly, which is actually what we will achieve. So if once this is smaller than one, so if this is smaller than one, then it means there exists these unitaries u1 to un. Uh, and even with some positive probability, I pick them if I just do this randomly with the property that uh, that is sum 1 over n ui tensor identity rho n ui tensor identity dagger <coughs> is actually less than or equal to 1 plus, min plus epsilon times the expectation and also larger or equal than 1 minus epsilon times the expectation. Yes? That's the probabilistic method. So and in fact, of course, clearly by making capital N even bigger, I can make this probability very close to zero. Then it's saying that practically any, you can bet on it that, that a randomly chosen set of U1 to UN will have this property. Because you, with probability going close, going to one, you will, you will get this. So why does it solve our problem? Notice that on the left and on the right, these are states. So these are positive trace one objects. And so if I just look at the difference, it means that, that the difference between the randomized original state and, and the expectation m is, is plus minus epsilon m. So when I take the trace norm, the trace of m is 1. Uh, so I get this guy here minus m, uh, sorry, trace norm is less than or equal to epsilon. But it's clear it's a very much stronger, it's a much, much stronger uh, statement because it, it's about controlling each and every single eigenvalue of this difference here. OK, and so how do we make this less than 1? I guess you can, you can see this. So it's sufficient to make n so, uh, larger than, well, whatever. I mean, uh, so the, the dominating term is, is, uh, is up here. So it's this, it's this guy here. So we have a, a 1 over c epsilon square, 2 to the n mutual information between a and b, plus epsilon plus 3 epsilon. And then there must be some kind of logs here, no? So times uh, log of 2 a to the n, b to the n. But so do you see this is a, a con this is linear in, in, in n. So this is essentially 2 to the n information between a and b plus delta, where delta is arbitrarily small. And just define it like this. Yeah, so the, just, I'm just repeating this uh, because I know that it always takes time to get used to the information theoretical asymptotics. I want epsilon to be arbitrarily small, but the statements are always for arbitrarily small epsilon n sufficiently large n. Right? So once you give me, I mean, so the, the, the proofs, it's sufficient to think of epsilon as being fixed because we can always make n large enough. So, so this is a constant. This is practically a constant compared to the, to the exponential. So I can just, uh, in, for a large enough n, this is what it is. And that's the end of the proof. Yeah, so that's here. Yeah, I hope that made sense. I mean, it was really it's just straightforward application. And so you can, you see this, this kind of thing, it can be done. Uh, I mean, you can generalize this a little bit more. It's really not that important that, for example, the, the, these y's here, sorry, the, the y's are really all isospectral. They don't have to be unitary uh, conjugations of the same thing. What mattered was only that we had 
for example, an upper bound so that we could do this rescaling. The upper bound, so the kind of the, this exponentially tight control over the eigen of the spectrum, that was important. That has to be universal for all of them. And you need something out of the expectation. So in fact, you can apply a similar thing even if, if you just, for example, if you know that rho is, a, is written as an expectation value, <coughs> so is a, is a probabilistic mixture of other states. Then, of course, rho tensor n is a probabilistic mixture of exponentially many states. Right? Because, uh, because the support of the measure will just be, you just go to the Cartesian power. And this here says something about, you, that, uh, it, it says it's a statement that you can rewrite this convex combination up to an approximation in trace norm. If you're happy with that, you can rewrite this convex combination with a number of terms that is, that is given by a mutual information. or more general entropic, some uh, expression in terms of entropy. But in fact, it will always, I mean, uh, without writing it down, it will always have the character of, uh, of a mutual information. So uh, yeah, so that was kind of one of these early applications of the sampling bound. I mean, this looked very interesting from the, from the information theoretical point of view. Uh, so in the, in the remainder of today, I want to, oh, there's plenty of time. I want to show that this actually has some serious implications to, to information theoretical problems that were considered before. I mean, this is, of course, this is a bit gratuitous because we just invented the question in the, in the same paper where we solved it. So in, in fact, so for the people who, who studied quantum information before, what I want to show is that this that this decorrelation result gives, uh, allows you, are you a very simple and, and as far as I know, never written up, never in this form written up proof of the of so-called state merging and of entanglement distillation, of, uh, of the correctness of a particular entanglement distillation protocol. So let's see. I guess I, I think since I skipped some things in the beginning about norms and distances, I might have to I might have to add a little postscript on on uh, on fidelity. I, I, I'm not sure if well, actually I don't know. If maybe this was discussed last week, but in case not, I I just. Uh, I'll just uh, say a few words about this. So this is a postscript to, to distances between states. So you know that when we have a state, when, well, we consider two states on the same system, uh, we can find purifications. psi and phi in A tensor A prime, such that the following is true. So we have trace over A prime of this uh, psi, and this is trace over A prime of phi. Yeah. <coughs> so it's always possible to find this and recall that uh, that any puri so, so they call these things purification of a state uh, row. So we recall that any purific two purifications of the same state are related by unitary. So whenever you have <coughs> psi, uh, no, let's say nah, that's also terrible. And rho equals 
equal to trace A prime psi tilde. Then there exists this, well, in general, I guess, isometry u from A prime to A tilde. or well in general even partial isometry such that uh, such that phi tilde is equal to the identity operator tensored with this u acting on phi. So so this this observation it gives rise to I mean, it gives rise not just this observation, but uh, this observation is related to this definition here. So for, for, for these two states, uh, rho and sigma, we define the fidelity, which is f of rho sigma, as the, as the maximum. I, mean, I could write sub, but it's actually easy to see it's a maximum over all purifications. Uh, psi and phi of this here, trace phi times psi. So this is phi psi mod squared. Yeah, and you see this, this, is, this is really just about optimizing over certain over unitaries here. I mean, once you go to sufficiently big spaces, you just embed everything in sufficiently large auxiliary space A prime, then it's really just about unitaries. Once you fix the particular purification. So, uh, so here's another thing that I used already, this trick. Uh, also, as I also recall, you can always choose as a particular purification psi naught, for example, um, square root of rho tensor identity acting on this particular state phi. So this phi is a purification of the identity in this set, in this sense here. And so then. Uh, so kind of a special purification. And that means that any other psi will have very simple form. It's just the square root row tensor product with this, uh, well, I will just call it unitary, but you have to understand this is a unitary once you enlarge the spaces sufficiently. Or I guess, well, I guess in this case, no, in this case, I, well, OK, in this case, it's, it's just a partial isometry. Never mind, never mind. <coughs> so then you can do this optimization here almost explicitly. So then it's kind of it's just a little lemma that, uh, <coughs> that f of rho sigma is this here. It's the, is the product of the square roots of rho and sigma trace norm squared. So this thing, it's, it's clearly always between 0 and 1, because we're talking here about just inner product of, of uh, unit vectors if these are trace 1 states. <coughs> and in fact, so this is kind of part 1, part 2, uh, P of rho sigma, I don't, I don't know if this is the a standard notation, is defined as square root of 1 minus f of rho and sigma, is actually a metric on S of A. <coughs> and, well, what is more, it's contractive, so 
maybe I should have called this 3 because you logically you want to prove 3 first, sorry. So P is contractive under CPTP maps. So that's very easy to see if your map is simply a partial trace because uh, Well, essentially because of the way this is defined via purifications. Whenever, whenever, uh, when you have a purification of the original state and the partial trace, then this gives you already automatically a purification of the partial trace state. <coughs> and then you recall Steinspring that every map up to an isometry is just a partial trace. So it's, it's enough to, I mean, so the first observation is actually enough to prove this. And then, there is a, and then there is a fourth one, which relates this, this metric to the trace norm. And it's something like this. So the half the trace distance between rho and sigma is less than or equal to p of rho sigma. So it dominates the, the trace norm. And in fact, there is also an inequality in the opposite direction, but it's a, the only one I know is a nonlinear one. So the upshot of that is convergence in in the metric, in the trace norm metric, is equivalent to the convergence in the p metric. Okay. So why I wanted to uh, why I wanted to discuss this? So it's. Uh, uh, this, it has the following. It has the following. Yeah. So this is, I guess. Uh, 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 uh. So you see this. Okay. This lemma, which I, I will essentially leave as homework. So this is essentially spectral decomposition. You just write down these unitaries, and you see that there is, is this, this fidelity is simply the maximum of a certain trace. And uh, it boils down to this here. So all these other things, also this one, I don't want to prove the furthermore. So it's because of the contractive property. Uh, and in fact, uh, because of the definition that you can always lift any mixed states to pure states with the same fidelity. And that's kind of, that's the other thing. For a pure state, if rho and sigma are pure, then Purification is a very trivial concept. You just can tensor with another pure state on the auxiliary system. So the fidelity of pure state is just this. It's just a trace of phi psi. <coughs> so, so it's enough to prove that it's a metric on pure states, and then you can, uh, and then you can just take partial traces. So yeah, this is, I, this is uh, either homework or, or already proved, which I don't know. Which is depends on you, really. <coughs> So you can view this as an extension of a metric extension of, of, of this statement here, that any two purifications are related by a unitary. So here I say, if the two states, if I actually have two different states that have a certain distance, then I can find purifications that are close by. And, this pur and, and, and more, more precisely, even if I fix the one purification, I can find a partial isometry to, to map the other purification to something close by to the first one. Yeah, so that's the upshot here. So given, given I, didn't know, I don't know which order I did, psi in A tensor A prime, rho equal to the partial trace, and the same, the same as phi, uh, sigma equal to the partial trace of phi, then there exists this, in general, partial isometry uh, u such that is 
equal to identity tensor. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's not what I want to say. Uh, such that for psi prime equal to the identity tensor u of psi, I have uh, phi psi prime modulo squared equal to the fidelity, which is something like 1 minus the trace norm by, the other, by this other observation. OK, so I want to I wanna use these kind of things. Uh, I want to make use of this in, a, in an information theoretical setting. So, so let me introduce uh, the so uh, given some state rho AB is a partial trace of a, a third system R of psi uh, RAB. And you should think of it eventually as, as an asymptotic version that actually will consider the same problem given this row, you look at row tensor n and then take an asymptotic limit of n going to infinity. So this is this is somehow shared between parties A, B, and what I call the reference R. So the, it's 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 really just there so that we can speak of a purify of a pure state. There will no there will no CP maps acting on R. So we just keep acting on A and B in a particular way to to achieve a certain transformation. So this is the kind of <laughs> pictures that we like to draw. So A is Alice, B is Bob. They are far apart, and for some reason, they, and there's also this reference, which is even further, farther apart. For some reason, they, they end up sharing this state. So kind of their, their collective system is in this state. And for some reason, they even know what the state is. So the, the goal is to, is to arrive at this situation. There's R here. <coughs> And you have the A system and the B system here. And you have a state psi tilde, which is close to psi in the fidelity metric, let's say. So let's call this A. I should I would like to introduce different names so that so if you don't get uh, unnecessary confused, I don't know. A bar and B bar. I just isomorphic to A. So, so the, I mean, I should, maybe I should, may, probably you'll notice it by now. So one of the reasons why I don't like matrices is because they don't allow me to identify what are the systems. I mean, for me, this can still be a, a matrix space. The, the point is I need to distinguish Alice's from Bob's and from, from Charlie's and, and Tom, Dick, and Harry's. And that's why I need all these letters. That's, that's the only reason. So, so these, these, these are just labels for different systems. Yeah, so as an information theoretical pr primitive, what, what, what we want to achieve is that initially, there is given a certain correlation, certain pure state correla correlating these three parties. And after a sequence of transformations, which of course should in, can involve, for example, physically sending one of the systems Know, handing it over from Alice to Bob, you know, it's some kind of spin or whatever, in a, which has to be in sitting in a box to pre prevent decoherence. So you should end up here. So in general, it should be clear that you have to send quantum information for that. Why? Because uh, A and R are somehow entangled in the, in, in, in <coughs> generically. And, uh, and not sending quantum information would, is essentially saying you're decohering this entanglement. So the goal, but let's, let's be a bit more, uh, uh, 
bit more uh, I mean trans tra translated in a different in a different language so another thing that we expect is that we need even if it's not quantum communication we need to do some kind of communication I mean the simplest protocol is really there is this system here whatever its size is so the log of its dimension that's the number of qubits it translates to this number of qubits they can go from Alice to Bob to achieve this and then Alice is just left with with and a pure state in her system. <coughs> so I shouldn't say this. The goal is expressed by this transformation. So the, the protocol can involve the following elements. Uh, you use entanglement. So in fact, it will be enough to consider maximally entangled state of some appropriate Schmidt rank. And <coughs> Uh, so, Schmidt rank, let's say 2 to the e, so that e is the number of EPR pairs, and I'm allowed to use free classical communication. So that's another thing I didn't discuss, and that I, I was hoping that that some uh, that it would be discussed. Either I would have time to do it, or that it's somebody who would have done it. That's teleportation. So this teleportation is is a particular such protocol <coughs> whereby uh, Alice can effect sending a, uh, an arbitrary state of a qubit to Bob using one EPR pair and two bits of classical communication. So you should think of this as a generalization of, of, uh, of, of this teleportation protocol. So I, I don't think you actually need to understand teleportation to understand what's going on now, but uh, but it it might help if you've seen this if you've seen this before. So the aim is simply that the state shared between the, so this is this is Alice and this is Bob. So each of them initially only has this unique system A and B respectively. At the end of the day, Alice still has her system and Bob has something that's actually composed of two systems. Yeah, so I introduced this this separation so that I can so that I know what is the communication here. Right? I mean, when, when you translate this into CP maps, for example, then, then uh, local operations are, are maps that only involve all the systems that are designated to be in the position of Alice. And non-local communication is something that has an input on Alice and an output on Bob's side. Right? So this, this division is only there so that we can, so that we can distinguish the local from the non-local operations. Yeah, okay, so maybe I try to write down actually the, the kind of maps that we... So the, that kind of what, what this should translate into in a, in a, in a protocol. I mean, so in, in, terms of, in terms of maps. So what does it mean that we share entanglement? What that means is just actually, is, is simply stepping back and saying actually, it's not just the state psi that is here. There is also another state sitting here. So sharing the, the bits of entanglement, it really is, uh, OK, let me, put, let me put here capital K. Huh? Sharing the entanglement, this is, that is really that we consider psi. RAB tensored with phi k, A naught, B naught. Yeah? So that's the easy part. 
And then I want to say free classical communication, oh yeah, and of course free local operations. <coughs> and let's actually simplify our, our world a little bit. Let's assume that the classical communication is only from left to right. So then, again, let's, let's try to think of how we build a model, right? So this means the, that every protocol con must break down into three distinct phases. One, where Alice does some local operations. So there's some CP map here. And to be precise, it's an instrument. Because, so it's an, it's an instrument, it's just a family of CP maps such that this, the, their sum is completely, is trace preserving. Each of these component CP trace decreasing maps that corresponds to obtaining a measurement outcome. This is something because we need to, uh, the second phase comes now. Alice needs to communicate something. So that's essentially a measurement outcome. And of course, it's something that you could just make up. You could just also send some letter along with to Bob, but that's not of interest to us. So everything that, that is worth communicating must come from the state. And then based on this message, based on this classical information, there must be a, a, a transformation of Bob. Yeah, okay, so here is, here is, we have, you must have an Alice's instrument. And because we have free classical communication, we don't have any limitation on, on how many outcomes this is. So it's just a family of T alphas, alpha from some suitably large set, uh, T alpha CP, and the sum of the T alpha is trace preserving. So these T alphas, what do they act on? They must act on, on whatever is there on Alice's side. So so it goes from A tensor A naught, oops. To itself. Because it's a each of, I mean quantum mechanically it's just it leaves it leaves Alice's system in her hand. I mean there's no there's no other things that go to Bob. What goes to Bob is this alpha. What that means is that his operation, which now we don't need to think about instrument because we ask him only to we don't care if he has some extra information here, right? Like, like I said, this letter or whatever that can come from Alice, we don't care about this. We care about what is this final state that Alice Bo and Bob in the reference share. So Bob's uh, some kind of decoding that is, these are CPTP maps, uh, the alpha, and they go from whatever his system uh, was. So it's D tensor D naught, and I want this to go to A tensor B. <laughs> oh yeah, why not? I mean, let's put the, let's put, so these are the A bar and the B bar, but they are isomorphic. So the, now I can rephrase what the goal is in terms of these nice CP maps. Uh, so what is, the post what is the state at the end of, the, of this whole procedure? Well, OK, so uh, we, had, we had the initial state. Psi tensor phi k. And this is acted on by these t alphas, right? And that's on Alice's side. And on Bob's side, there is, or oh, which way? Oh, no, I don't know which way is which. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's start on the left. Reference is does nothing, as usual. So this is ID on R. There is the T alpha, and then there are the D alphas. And I just sum over all of them, right? Because, because I, ha I don't know, I don't, I mean, I, I just integrate over all the different outcomes and over all these messages that pass along. 
So that this should be close to uh, well, whatever psi r a bar b bar tensor with some something I don't really care of what is in B naught. I mean, and this is the definition of the goal, right? I mean, once I translate all this story over there into, into uh, once I make a model for each element, like the local operational communication zone, so this, it should be clear that this, this models the state at the end of this kind of protocol. <coughs> yeah, and this should be fidelity here, for example. Plenty of time. <coughs> okay, so uh, is it clear so far? Questions? <coughs> so any so given, given, uh, given such an epsilon, we can, I define the elements on the right-hand side to be a state merging protocol. And there is one other parameter here. So this epsilon serves as a kind of, an, is a clearly an approximation error. And there is here this k that, is, that I treat as a resource. So I mentioned already, so if you, if you know teleportation, you know that if k is larger than the dimension of of A here, then there is such a protocol. And it's just teleport A using a sufficiently large uh, maximally entangled state of Schmitter and K. The amount of communication will simply be uh, twice uh, K square, K square. So the alpha is the range of a K square. So the objective, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, what I'm saying is this is one particular, I mean, everything that satisfies this condition over there, I define this is a state merging protocol, right? And I said teleportation is one of them. Now, clear, that means that if K is large enough, there is no question about existence of such thing, right? So the question that you face is, what is the smallest K such that uh, state merging protocol exist with fidelity larger than 1 minus epsilon. Yeah? And let's call this k of rho epsilon. Yeah, so this number is clear that this only depends on rho a b because the purification is just is a purely formal thing that this interest is going. And so the question that we have is what, so how much, how, is, how does this then, okay, again, we are in the information theoretical regime, epsilon, is, we would like to get rid of this epsilon, so the, the do, way we do is we go to the appropriate many copy limit. And in particular, the second question is, uh, so it's one and two. No, 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 it's this one here. It's the size, it's the schmittering of the entangled state that you need. Uh, so it shouldn't be a surprise that we have a 1 over n log k of rho tensor n comma epsilon. So what does this converge to when n goes to infinity and epsilon goes to 0? Yeah, so this is, this is, um, this is one version of asking how much quantum communication do you need to, to effect this here? So there is a special case of this when the entangled state is simply an entanglement between A and R. In this case, 
is well studied. So that's something that was introduced by Schumacher, essentially. Schumacher's quantum data compression is, is asking exactly that question, or um, is effectively asking this question, how much quantum communication does needs to pass from Alice to Bob to transfer the entanglement with a distant party from Alice to Bob? And it's given by as the asymptotic answer there is the entropy of A. That's the special case when psi factors into something of AR tensored with pure state of B. So why I'm doing, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm using a bit of a, a conceptual identification. I mean, obviously, I introduced this in a particular way where, where my measure of complexity is the amount of entanglement. But via teleportation, this is really the same. So if I have free classical communication, having, with this free classical communication, sending a qubit or sharing uh, an one, one uh, EPR pair is the same thing. Operationally, I can, I can having, having a channel that sends this qubit perfectly, Alice can just, so having this channel connecting Alice, she can just prepare a two qubit state with this maximum entanglement, send one of these systems through the channel, and, uh, and of course the, end, this, the state at the end will be this maximum entanglement state, and vice versa, we can invoke this teleportation protocol. So the, the, the fact that we have this free classic communication essentially says, makes the, the amount of entanglement equal to what you would need in communication. So I don't know if I should uh, if I should tell it to you right now. Any, I th maybe that's maybe that's uh, maybe that's the maybe that's what I what I should just put down right <coughs> here. So the the answer is this here, which is the entropy of rho a b minus the entropy of rho b. So this is the theorem that I want to show how this can be derived from, from the previous decorrelation argument. So by analogy with classical information theory, we call this the conditional entropy. So when you have a, a distribution of two random variables, then the conditional entropy is one way of writing the conditional entropy. It's the joint entropy minus <coughs> one of the marginals. Yeah? Yes, yeah, excellent, cost, excellent question. So you will find out when we study the protocol, actually. So when it's negative, that's when this B naught system becomes important. Then we should start caring about this, and also this A naught system. So when it's negative, it turns out then there is a, a protocol of this type where the output state is not, so where, where, where you don't put an entanglement state at the beginning and, and it's lost at the end, but it's the other way around. So you don't need to put anything here and out pops some entanglement. But it, I'll, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. Hmm. Sorry? It's identity R here. It's just because of my, my uh, conventional ordering of the three systems. So this is R, A, B. <coughs> so as a matter of fact, I don't think I will I will, so I, like all these information theoretical statements, the proof of this is always in two distinct parts. You always have to prove separately lim sub is less than or equal and lim inf is larger or equal. So I will, uh, so I will not prove the second one. So that's a kind of a, one of these things like previously where you just juggle a bit entropies and use a, a, a very small set of well-established inequalities. So after a finite number of permutations, you find the exit of this game, and you, f you get this lower bound. So you can, I mean, your, your computer can do this, actually, with, without even, I mean, or your, your Shakespeare monkeys can do this. I mean, these this lower bound proofs, they're all the same. And so I won't show that you cannot do better than that. What I, what I will show is a protocol that is, OK, let me, let me comment on another thing. So the, 
this number here is always less than or equal to the entropy of A. And in fact, it's equal only if rho AB is a tensor product. No, 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 that's not true. No, no, eh, sorry, sorry, I think, it, of course, yeah, I was right. So it's, this is less than or equal to rho S of A with equality only if rho AB is a tensor product, which means that in this original, in this original setting here, so if these two are a tensor product, it means that also I can break up the reference in a part of RA and RB. Yeah, why is that? Because if I have a product state, a particular purification is actually just the tensor product of that purification, tensor that purification. And since then, then it's just unitary equivalent on doing something up here. So it's basically just a basis choice up here that makes, then suddenly I can see it. So in that case, it boils down to this Schumacher thing. So in all other cases, the answer over there is strictly less than S of A, which means that, to come back to, to the, your question before, generically, you get better than just teleporting. And why is that? Because there is already some correlation in rho AB that you can exploit. So that, that's kind of another kind of, uh, so, uh, that's another um, conceptual point that I would like to make. So this, this particular game, we didn't just come up with it out of the blue. That was, I mean, a group of people were starting interested in this in the, in the early 2000s. There is kind of a, a very well-known and, and classic and, and actually a very important cornerstone of classical information theory, so-called Slepian-Wolf uh, theorem, or the simplest case of it, which is to do with data compression. So, it, uh, so if, if Alice observes a, a, a source X of, of classical observation, then to compress it, it's, a cla it's a sh one of the fundamental theorems of Shannon, to, to compress it and somehow to send the minimum amount of information to, to a Bob so that he can learn X, she needs entropy of X many bits per realization of the source in their simple economics. Slepian and Wolf asked, so what if no, Bo already knows something? Knowing something means he has access to another observation Y that is jointly distributed with X. And then the answer is H of X given Y, the, entropy, the conditional entropy. That's the number of bits Alice has to send kind of to top up his knowledge, his partial knowledge. <coughs> and so this is a, a quantum version of that. So it's kind of, it's, it's at least formally, it looks, the answer looks the same. And also the game is very similar. Uh, Alice and Bob have parts of the same source. And Alice's goal is to, to give her knowledge to Bob. Right? If you, I mean, this is already, of course, this is already quantum information yoga. This is, this is uh, accepting a point of view where every quantum state is, in some weird sense, information. Let's not worry about it too much, I guess. So here's the protocol. So let me see if I forgot anything. So we need to, I need these epsilon randomizing, uh, epsilon decorrelating maps somehow, right? So we have epsilon randomizing family ui on a to the n. Yep. Oops. For, for which state? I don't want to decorrelate Alice and Bob, actually. So here's, here's the trick. For rho a r. So that's the partial trace over b of psi a r a b. And so let me sum identity tensor u i. Rho A, rho, I guess I should say R A to the tensor power N is in a, in, the, in a suitable norm. And let's, in fact, since I, for the, let's, 
they allow me to switch to the purification metric. So I said already it's equivalent to the to the trace in, trace distance. So this is in fidelity larger equals one minus epsilon. Uh, what do I need? Rho r tensor n tensor rho a tensor n. Where n is is, is asymptotically given by this number here, right? this e, uh, information between A and R. So that's what we, what we learned just previously. So the protocol goes as follows. So Alice prepares So she prepares a uniform superposition of, of such states here in, in a suitable auxiliary space. So I, used, I, I want to use A0 already for the teleportation. Let's call it an A, A1. Yeah, so the situation we have at that point is there is this RBA, and then there is also this A one sitting here. So here's psi, and here you have zero. I just call it zero to have a, a label for it. So you see, I don't want to, I don't want Alice to introduce some kind of CP map. So that uh, when you think about it, you want to map pure state to pure state, ideally. So when you, when you break down all of these instruments and CP maps into Krauss operators, then every Krauss operator that you encounter, it should, it should do the same here. It should also, I mean, or rather on average. So most of these Krauss operators, they will have this same effect. <coughs> so that motivates why we, why we try to, why we tr always try to keep track of the, of a global pure state here. <coughs> so instead of these, applying these unitaries randomly, she will just use this superposition as a, as a source of randomness. So she applies a big unitary, which is simply this. It's the sum over these ui's. So they now live on a to the n, tensor with i on a1. Yeah, actually, I should be here. I should be really precise. It's r, a n, r, n, b, n. And here we have psi to the tensor power n. So this is a unitary, right? So the good thing about this pure state picture is that I can, I can really just keep doing vectors and applying matrices to vectors instead of dragging around CP maps and conjugating by unitaries. So I, this kind of first observation, so, so Let's, we have to write down this, the new state, I guess. So let's call, we have phi. What does this phi live on? It has to have a component Rn, An, A1. Oh, I see A1 is maybe not really that great. I think I actually, it's impossible I change it. And I, don't want to, I don't want to get in conflict with later labeling. Let's just go down the alphabet. This A1 becomes C. So I C here. and b to the n. And that's just identity tensored with u acting on psi to the tensor power n. So this phi also is a label of n, of course. So and the, uh, the identity is on everything else, right? So whatever u acts on is only Alice, so this must be r, n, and b, n. So it's just local operation, but it kind of distributes the state in a different way across the different systems. So now note, when I look at the reduced state between, I mean, this is basically, where, where does the randomization come from? Well, if I trace over C here, 
this is where the, where the rhythm average over i comes from. So if I just look at phi r n a n here, this is close to the tensor product. So actually, this is the, the original. So let me just put it like this, tensor phi a to the n. Yes? <coughs> OK, maybe I, maybe I just write this again here. So I'll I'm very slow, but I, I, I hope I have enough time for everything. So phi r n a n. So this is just the, the corresponding density matrix partial traced is high, high fidelity with phi r n tensor phi a n. So second step, Alice and Bob will have to do something with C system. So it turns out the best thing they can do is Alice can just, will just teleport it. So the, the, the C is chosen small enough that somehow, asymptotically, there's nothing else to be gained. So teleports C to, to Bob. So that's, that's using uh, a rank K equal to dimension of C equal to this here. 2 to the n mutual information a and r uh, uh, e bits that allow me to use this, this bit of jargon. I know, sorry, sorry, that's not, that's not really true. That's not the number of e bits. So that's just the, the Schmidt rank. Sorry, Schmidt rank. And the appropriate number of classical bits of communication. <laughs> So at this point, Bob. So so then okay, it's, uh, I, I think I'm really just unable to to just boil it down to some simple formulas. <laughs> I always have to tell this story. So at this point, so this system goes over here. We observe that what what is left is in Alice's hand is now just that system, the same one as before, but it has changed its state because it's been randomized, and reference of course is still the same. So everything else in the purification of this phi r n uh, a n is now in the hands of Bob. Uh, in the hands of Bob, yeah. So has purification of phi r n a n, and is sitting. It's kind of uh, in the pair of systems b to the n and c. Yeah, and now we just stare at this and, and, and use this insight of the unitary uniqueness of the purification. So the, this one, we, we are given a purification. It's that one. It's, it's, sorry, it's, it's phi. That's kind of this physically the state after the teleportation is described by phi. But of course, also such a tensor product has a very simple purification. It's just I purify this one and I purify that one. And that means, by the, by the essentially by the definition of the fidelity, OK, no, let's first write down the purification. So, Phi R N A N is just painfully trace of a B N C of this guy here. Phi R N tensor Phi A N <coughs> is the partial trace over. Now here's something. We know a particular purification of this state here, of course. That's the original psi. So we have a psi to the tensor power n, a, uh, r a bar b bar, over the, all the a bar to the n and b bar to the n. 
Yeah, so this is the first one. Yeah, I hope this is, this is crucial, actually. So since we never touch the reference, its reduced state is, is still the same. I mean, we're always acting with trace-preserving maps. And so a particular purification, which is the one we are aiming for in the state merging, is actually that guy here. Tensored with, well, what is this one here? OK, now I guess I really have to I, I just, I just made a mistake here. So I don't want to change it now. So, so, so this phi a to the n, that's this row. This here is, is the same as this row n that I introduced over here. And remember that this one can be chosen to be in our randomization map. This was actually just a projection, the normalized projection onto some subspace. So in, by restricting the corresponding Hilbert space, I can actually just think of this as the identity operator on a suitably smaller space. So for this one, we also know a purification. So this is some just the trace over. Now I need a another system, so I put a phi L here. So L is equal to the dimension of A hat is essentially two to the n times the entropy of A. So this the maximally mixed is always purified by some maximally entangled state of Schmidt ring equal to the rank of this guy here. OK, I have the, I have this here is on A n and then something else. A hat and B hat, let's say. Sorry, I, mean, I should probably I should have thought about the notation a little bit before, but I, I, I realized that I just have to write down things a bit more carefully than I was planning to. Yeah, and so we know so these here here these two here are are have are high, have high fidelity, and so that means that there exists this unitary that is obtainable in principle by doing a singular value decomposition of an appropriate horrible matrix. So there exists this, uh, well, rather isometry that goes from B and C to what? Uh, so what we're tracing over here are all these guys. Here. So there's A to the N, there's A bar to the N, B bar to the N, and, and oh, I see, this is a B naught here. Uh, so that was what it was. It was a B naught in my original formulation. <laughs> such that these two purifications themselves become similar. Yeah, so that means uh, psi tensor n tensored with this phi l vector is, again, it's the same fidelity <coughs> larger than 1 minus epsilon then some identity tensor u, so this is all the r and a bits, because now we're talking, this is something that Bob can do, right? This is Bob here. I know you always have to, you have to always keep track of who has access to the system. These are now in Bob's hands after step two. Uh, and this is this unitary acting on, on our phi superscript n. So then that's the kind of that's the third part of the protocol. Bob, oh, this is not you, not you. It's V. You we had already. So Bob, Bob applies V. And that's it. That's the protocol. Because 
because that exactly gives us, here we have R A bar B bar. So that does indeed up to either trace distance or fidelity uh, what the definition demands, that at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, Bob, who has this A bar B bar system and the reference share this entangled state, the same one that was previously spread out over Alice and Bob, and the reference. And there is some extra stuff, which now you realize this is entanglement between, between, I shouldn't have called this A, A hat, huh? Okay, I use my powers and change this into, into all A nodes because because now it's, of course, now it's much more symmetric. So A node and B node is now a register that is spread out over Alice and Bob, and they share entanglement. So let's take, let's, let's take stock what the protocol actually does. Protocol uh, clearly achieves state merging. So it uses how much entanglement, uh, this amount of entanglement between A and R, E bits. So this is already normalized, divided by the number of copies, right? So when I go to the asymptotic limit, all these, all these things become equalities here. And, and on the other hand, it produces, it always leaves, all, uh, leaves, leaves uh, hang, uh, sitting around some entanglement. So leaves S of A E bits. So it's a it's a bit of a like an investment gain sort of thing, right? So so let's uh, let's say the in the in the simplest yeah let's let's talk about the simplest case when when this is bigger than that, right? So you need to provide a large number of uh, EPR pairs. So that, so that you can perform this state merging and then you're left with a bit less. Let's look at the difference anyway. The difference is what I claimed. Difference. So you know this is S of A plus S of R minus the joint entropy. One S of A cancels. So I'm left with S of R minus S of A R, which is the same as S of A B minus S of B. I hope you see why. Because we are having, a, we are talking about a pure state here, so the the reduced state on R is isospectral with that one on AB, and AR is isospectral with uh, that the state on B alone, because it's always it's always a bipartite cut, and then we use some we can use think of Schmidt decomposition, Schmidt values with respect. So this this entropy is equal to that, that entropy is equal to that, and this is equal to the condition entropy. Yeah, so I should. So at this point, you realize I should have refined my previous statement a little bit. I should have said, uh, so state merging protocol is actually a bit more general. It's something like this. It's, some, uh, it's something that takes in psi tensored with a suitably large maximum entangled state and outputs the merged state psi on this A bar B bar system tensored with another maximum entangled state. And the cost is quantified by the difference of entanglement. And so in, in this sense, you can see why the negative here is, makes perfectly good sense, because it's just a balance in your accounts. So there are situations where the mutual information is larger than S of A. That means the conditional entropy is, uh, is positive, in which case there is a net consumption of entanglement in this process. And there are other cases where it's the opposite, where this, neg this is negative, where you have a net gain. So you need a startup. You need to have a bit of a capital of, of entanglement. But then this process can be, can be done just purely by classical communication, and you gain entanglement. And that leads me to, so I will just uh, finish this as a speech without writing anything more, because the ball is full. Uh, so as a special case, if you now forget about the reference, if, if you just think about you know, what are the things that Alice and Bob see operations, they just have access to row AB jointly. And so there are these particular situations when S of A given B is negative, where there is a particular protocol that doesn't use 
I mean, actually, so you have to you have to think about this a little bit. Uh, maybe even maybe modify the argument here slightly. There is a protocol that doesn't even use any entanglement to start with, and eventually gives you minus s of a given b uh, EPR pairs per copy of the state in the limit. So you need to have a startup cost until you reach a certain amount of entanglement. So that may be a very inefficient protocol. So for that you need to know once s of a b given b is negative, you can actually extract somehow something. And then you just keep repeating, right? You have a long, long block of, of many copies of row. You just chop it up into smaller blocks. And for each of the smaller blocks, you will execute this protocol. It will just keep generating more and more EBITs. And the amount, so the asymptotic rate you achieve is the negative of this here, which has a name, actually. So this is, this is the negative of the so-called coherent information denoted like this. So the, this, this angle bracket is to remind you of the coherence. And this is a, this is a, I mean, once you know this, you can derive all sorts of other things. So the same number occurs in the expression for the quantum channel capacity. So by another modification of the same protocol, you can, you can prove that given a, given a channel and given a, a reference state so that you can construct a choice matrix with respect to that reference state, this negative conditional entropy is an attainable rate for asymptotically error-free error correction, uh, error-free transmission. <coughs> so this number gives a lower bound on the quantum channel capacity uh, and, uh, and a whole bunch of other uh, asymptotically error-free coding procedures. They all hinge on this one. So that was something that was figured out by Igor de Wettag and, and a little bit also by me in the early 2000s. And starting with, with this particular, well, with some version of this merging protocol. So if you take away something from this, then you learned, I think, already quite a bit about what modern quantum information theory is about. OK, thank you very much. Sorry? I think I have some references uh, in the in the paper. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. So the last reference on this, on this leaflet that I uh, gave to Sunda, it is the original paper on state merging. There is a long, there is a short version that has only the conceptual bits, which nobody understands apparently. Did you, in the where did you come? Did you just give it this paper to people? It's, it's here and it's outside. Oh, I never got a copy of it. Uh, you take it. And you can also download it from the website of, of, the, of the workshop. Okay. Any other questions? Well, then maybe we should, we should close. And uh, I should say, I mean, I should repeat the words of Vern. I mean, it's, uh, thanks, to, thanks to Sunder for organizing all this. And thanks to all of you for, for your active interest. It was, it was a great pleasure to think about ways of <laughs> connecting functional analysis and quantum information. <laughs> even if it was just an attempt. <laughs>